Good morning, my name is Myung Shin and I'm Assistant Professor of STEM Education at Fresno State. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, today's keynote speaker, uh, Dr. David Stobel. Uh, Dr. Stobel is a professor of Education and Policy Studies and African American Studies at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Uh, he's a leader in critical race theory, school community relationship, youth culture, and the relationship between housing and K-12 school systems. His work has investigated the significance of race in the quality of schools located in communities that are changing both racially and economically. He has been working with many young people, community groups, and schools to develop curricula that address issues of social justice. Today, uh, Dr. Stobel will talk about the critical problems in the school system and how we can move beyond uh, being frustrated, feared, and struggling under the system. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Stobel. Well, peace and greetings, everybody. Can the folks in the back hear me okay? Yeah. Perfect. Now, I'm going to get this uh, mic thing. Now, if it starts to feel like a talk show, my apologies, right? Um, now, what happens in all these spaces, and thank you all first for inviting me. I am much more used to being uninvited than invited. So thank you all for uh, sticking your neck out and bringing somebody like myself from Chicago. Before I begin, I want to first recognize the indigenous nations whose lands our feet rest on. And many, in many cases, we no longer bring those names because those names are no longer spoken. So I want to make sure that I acknowledge the First Nations people whose land, who have allowed us to rest our feet on these lands. Second, as part of the Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez conference, I want to make a particular recognition to the Filipino families who were part of the United Farm Workers Movement, who very rarely get credit in terms of what they did to actually make sure that the, <coughs> that the movement is, was living and that it was actually one that was a people's movement. And when I say a people's movement, I'm actually talking about those things that have engaged folks and challenged us to do things in particular ways and to challenge us to shift things. This mic is ringing, so let me see if I can do something with this one maybe. Oh, we got, oh it's still ringing, all right. Okay, maybe that's a, yeah, yeah, that's a little bit better. Um, so one of the things that with you all as being K-12 teachers and we're preparing to become K-12 teachers, I first want to commend you. First, because it's not a whole lot of y'all. Second, and I'll say this very openly, and maybe I'll, you know, let me try this. Can folks hear me all right? Word. Okay, let me, they'll figure this, they'll figure out the mic situation, but I want to talk to you all in particular. Yep. Right. That, was, that was kind of fresh, right? But I want to talk to you all in particular because looking at you now, and I, you know what, I probably don't even need it, but we can, yeah, we can figure it out. Yep, just in case, we got, we got it on deck. So this thing in terms of education, and I am very surprised to see you all today show up like this, because I'll tell you all the truth. I thought I was going to walk into a room full of white folks, right? And now I look at it, I'm like, oh, shit, damn. <laughs> right? So it's a little different in Fresno. Y'all get out a little different, right? And right, like this is, and I'm, I'm saying this explicitly because in the country, teaching is still 81.1% white and female, right? And we very rarely talk about that. And the question that I'm always asking as a researcher is that does not happen on purpose. And when it happens in that way, that means that certain folks have been locked out of teaching. And you all are interrupting that paradigm. And I think that's critically important because I'm in a city that is 35% black, 35% Latino, 10% Asian, another 20-some percent white, 
and we still can't get black and brown folks in teaching. And that's to me is a misnomer. The issue is we haven't gone out and gotten them. And it looks like here that somebody went out and got y'all, <laughs> right? In a particular way. Let me say something else in, re in reference to something that you all will experience or have already experienced as teachers in training or teacher ed candidates. You will go into professional developments that are mind-numbing experiences that are intended to destroy your brain cells. <laughs> right? Some of you all have already sat in them, right? You look, at the, you look at the content, you hear the people, and you say, this has nothing to do with my reality. This has nothing to do with the young folks that I care about. Why am I listening to this shit? <laughs> right? In fact, sometimes in professional developments, I have visions where I rip off my arm and I beat myself in the head. <laughs> right? Sometimes in professional developments, if it's in a higher space and it's a window, me and the homies always think about how we can jump out. <laughs> right? And if it's grass on the ground, we're like, man, shit, it's grass. We can... <laughs> We can, we can make that work, just go, right? So now, if we have these experiences as adults, what does it mean for young folks in our classrooms? Right, and we always think about this thing, and we make this mistake in teaching. We always make this thing around that young folks are actually supposed to listen to us, right? That is the worst assumption you could have. Because if you are actually in that space to do what schools are originally intended to do, young folks should not be listening to you. Because we got to ask a different question around the purpose of schools. And this becomes dangerous. And this gets me uninvited a lot. Because when we talk about schools, we have to talk about the difference between school and education. They are two different things. And because they are different, I am much more concerned about people who are defending schools. Because schools, and I'm going to say this, schools were never really intended to educate people. Schools were intended to prepare you for certain places, whether that be work, whether that be some type of form of industry. And we also see a different relationship in some spaces. So some of you all have heard this term, the school to prison pipeline. It's a little deeper than that. I teach in a prison, right? And when I walk into the prison, there's these two arrows that are called up down, right? One is pointing away from you and one is pointing to you. And the sign says, please step to the right. Now, I see that, you know, in prisons when you walk in, you know, these doors shut or what have you, and you are in this, you are in this building that will be very difficult for you to leave unless you have some type of clearance. When I walk into schools, why do in some schools I see the exact same thing? You walk through a metal detector. You got a uniform on. You got some weird form of observation. You're told to walk on lines. You're told to walk with your hands behind your back, right? You are not allowed to touch your other classmates. You have silent lunches, right? Now, if you want to know how to torture a third grader, give them a silent lunch, right? Because if I was in third grade right now and somebody gave me a silent lunch, I would be kicked out the next day. Now, I, I can see my third grade self like, what? You want me to talk? Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> well, I'm talking, right? Yeah, I, I'm talking. Just because you don't want me to, I'm talking. Talk, 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 right? And I'll probably be saying that to the security guard. Talk, 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 right? And we do a, you all do a slick thing here in California because you don't call them security guards. You call them school resource officers. <laughs> resource to what? Right? And we never ask these questions, but then we get caught into the space around safety. Safety for whom? Right? Because most, most of the assumption, especially if you work with black and brown, Southeast Asian populations, the assumption is around their deviance before it is around their genius. And if you operate in a space that is operated and structured around their deviance, you will have those particular rules. And those rules will be paramount to those of carceral institutions. 
So we are no longer talking about a school to prison pipeline. In many cases, we are talking about a school and prison nexus. They have become the same thing. So now the decision has to be whether or not you will engage in that same type of behavior that has existed in time immemorial in the United States. Hence, school. So now, as teacher candidates, we have to make this particular decision, what does it mean to educate folks? And educating folks means that you're going to have to face some questions that you don't necessarily like. You're going to have to engage stuff that you've never thought about. But you have to do it. Because if you don't, you are right back on that pathway to dehumanization. And many of our young folks are in school, and they're not resisting just to be resistant. They are resisting their dehumanization. Right? So now when we talk about this in real time, it's not as popular. Because now you got somebody in Washington, D.C. who says, look, to hell with all this, let's just privatize everything. Right? Ironically, somebody who has never been in a school will probably not be in a school and is scared of shit of people in schools. Right? I'm talking about Betsy DeVos. Right? And we, gotta, and we have to name those names, right? Because it's another thing in education, right? This is the nice field, right? Everybody just wants to be nice, right? And it was so nice, right? But the lives of our students are not always nice. And this thing around that niceness is also this kind of capitulation, right? They're nice until especially when we talk about students of color, right? They're nice when they're here, and then, oh, 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 oh my God. They're the same size as me. Now, I look for more references to lock them up. And many times we make a mistake and we think that we're only talking about males of color. Let's put this in the street. In New York City, the racial, ethnic, and gender group that leads New York City in suspensions and expulsions are black girls. What's the number one, what's the number one determinant or the thing that, they've been, that they're being suspended for? And check out this term, willful defiance. Now, let's get into this. I do not know of a young person who is not willfully defiant. What is the first word that young people tell you when they start to talk? No. no. <laughs> right? And we always think about it, and it's actually, I always think that that's a good answer to stuff. Right? It's not something I run away, run away from because all the stuff that we do to them as young folks is trying to control them. Right? And school becomes this space where you kill the question, why? Anybody who's a parent, anybody got a little brother and sister, what's the worst question they could ask you? And then what do you tell them? Because I said so. Because, right? And, and look, look, let's break this down. Because I said so is the lie. It's really because you don't know or you don't want to talk about it. The same thing happens in schools. When a young person puts you to the test and you won't know, you revert back to, because I said so, right? And it's back to this dehumanization. Now, let me ask you all another question, and this becomes important. How many of you all, by a show of hands, will say that you had, in your K-12 experience, a good teacher? Now, same, similar question. Those same people that you all think about as the good teacher, how many of those teachers were always in trouble by a show of hands? All right? And we never, read, we never think about this, right? Those good teachers that we had, I would argue, were not concerned about school. They were much more concerned about your education. And they always operated in silos. Because they were the ones who were saying, look, I had a teacher pull me to the side and was like, you know there's some bullshit, right? <laughs> and, and I was like, oh, oh, <laughs> really, right? 
And the first thing she said was, look, the larger world wants to do something to you. They have made a decision on your head. They are saying that there's only certain things that you are able to do. In this place, it is your responsibility to prove them wrong. Now you tell an eight-year-old that, I was like, word. Everything <laughs> is about proving them wrong, right? Because now you exist in these spaces that now we don't ask critical questions around. And when you don't ask those critical questions, we go right back to this dehumanization, which is a continuation of the settler colonial project in education, right? And we don't use, like to use those words, right? We don't like to use white supremacy. Now, let me be clear. When I say white supremacy, I am not talking about white nationalist terror. That is a part of white supremacy. When I say white supremacy, I am talking about the perceived views and values of white Western European descended heterosexual able-bodied cisgendered men as normal, right, and good. Right? <clears throat> <clears throat> and everything else is othered. Everything else is made strange. Everything else is used as a, rational, a rationale by which to encapsulate you, to contain you. So now, what are we doing, as my good friend Patrick Kamiyan says, what are we doing to break free? And that's a different question because we always think about schools as nice. If you go to certain schools, there's a carceral relationship in that space. And when I say carceral, it's about the containing and controlling of people. And now, what does it mean in that curriculum? And why wouldn't a young person disconnect from you when you are engaging them in a blatant lie? Please, let us stop this Columbus bullshit. Right? We, we, we still got little ones singing, 1492, sail the ocean blue. Uh-uh. No, if I'm in a kindergarten classroom, here's what we're going to start with. Everybody, what does it mean to go the wrong way? <laughs> right? And not only what does it mean to go the wrong, what does it mean to go the wrong way and call people the wrong name? And then what does it mean to go the wrong way, call people the wrong name, and then send the rest of your homies to bring death and destruction? <laughs> now, that might not get me in the good graces of an administrator, but it is more accurate to the truth. And the second thing that I would do for all the literacy folks, I would use my context clues in reading Columbus's ship log, <laughs> right? Because it's published, right? And the first thing, the first thing, one well, of the first thing that Columbus says when he sees the Taino people, he says the Taino are beautiful and graceful people. They would make the greatest of slaves. Right? So now Stovall's conjecture, Columbus's words. So now we get into this, and please, let's miss the story on how we teach Abraham Lincoln. Right? That he was, that he was this great liberator of black folk, please. I used to go to a university where they had Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg's, Gettysburg address around the top of the building. Right? Because Abraham Lincoln, even in his debates with Stephen Douglas, he said, look, if I, had to, if I didn't have to free one slave, I would not. I'm only engaging this process to preserve the union. We've got to be clear about this, right? Because now we get into complexities that we don't think young folks can handle. And I always have to quote, and we always get into this thing, and no shade to the educational psychologists here. We always get this thing around age appropriateness, right? And here's the thing where it, it turns that on its head. If a young person is old enough to experience poverty, degradation, isolation, and marginalization, they are old enough to be told the truth, period, right? So now when we start, when we, and we have to start with that, right? And this is always this thing because, you know, we got, even in Chicago, the sons and daughters of the Confederacy came and gave a dedication to a Confederate grave site that's in Chicago, right? And then somebody said the genius shit that the Civil War was not about slavery. 
I said, oh, oh okay. <laughs> well, first, let's do something. Let's read Jefferson Davis's Statement of the Confederacy. Let's read every state's Statement of the Confederacy. So Georgia, Florida, Mississippi, Alabama, and Texas. And what do they say? They say in all of those statements, I'm sorry, Tennessee, Arkansas is in that, Tennessee, Arkansas, and the Carolinas are in that too, and Virginia. They say in this statement that this is about the preservation of the culture that determines the separation of the races. Right? Not so lost conjecture, right? But real. And now we live in a space that if you engage young people with this, that you hate America. My first response is please. Second piece is, if I can't ask questions of the place that I'm living in, then I understand that that place probably refers to me as disposable before it refers to me as valuable. All right? And that's extremely unpopular. And 45 Cheeto at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue probably does not like that. <laughs> right now, I'll let y'all figure out who 45 Cheeto is <laughs> on another day. But this thing around, if we exist under these particular conditions, and we still want to hide and, and keep young folks away from this under the false premise that we're protecting them, then we got some real problems. And I would argue that somebody like myself has to be working in solidarity with you to shift that reality, right? And it's a tough, it's a tough sell, right? Because I know none of you got into teaching for the money. <laughs> Off top, right? Let's start there, right? But let's also ask these different questions. I am from Chicago. I am from a city that has 400,000 students in 600 plus schools, there are 126 schools that are K-8 that do not have libraries. And those schools are in the same places. So now I gotta ask a different question. How do you justify not having a library and one of your primary responsibilities is teaching what? Reading, literacy, how does this happen, All right? I was, just in a, I was just hearing about a school that a couple of friends of mine graduated from where they were engaged, they were engaged in a rat infestation with little ones, right? And the first thing I'm saying to myself is, if you are allowing a rat infestation to happen at a K-5 school, what are you saying about the young people in it? And that's a different question. We are here in the San Joaquin Valley. Right when you get outside of Fresno, you're in farmland. Those particular, and some, some, some families have been here historically, some families travel and are referenced as migrant workers. Now, the question becomes, what is happening in those classrooms and what are the assumptions that are placed on those young people's heads? And the question for you all is, how will you either feed into those assumptions or will you break the norm? Will you actually break the reality, right? Are you willing to interrupt this thing that perpetually dehumanizes folks? And now how will you do it? Because a lot of times people think about this thing around, you know, justice is this thing that just kind of happens on, from on high and you go into classrooms, and some of you all have had this. Anybody going into a classroom and looked at a teacher that's really doing their thing, and you're like, oh my God, it's magic. Right? I can never do that. Right? That's how I started off teaching. I was working with a fifth grade teacher, name was Miss Rao. Everybody would come in class, hella happy. But I was like, damn. Right? And you no, know, my fifth grade, my fifth graders, they come in looking at me like, well, Stovall, get out of here, man. Look. <laughs> they come in, they talking to Miss Ryle, and Miss Ryle's talking to them, and then they line up at the end of the day. She gives everybody a hug, cause, and then I said to myself, oh, this is magic, 
right? I can never expect to do that. And then Ms. Rouse sits me down and she says, well, I need you to understand something. Not only did I teach their parents, for some of them I taught their grandparents. I was like, oh, <laughs> right? So I'm not just talking to the young person. I am talking to their families. It's like, oh. And she said, and it took me about 15 years to figure that out. And I was like, damn. <laughs> right? She was like, she was like and you, won't, you won't get it. So if, don't worry about those first three years, right? We're all drowning, right? It's about 2% of y'all who will come in there and be fresh, right? You know, you'll have it, and we'll hate y'all. So, <laughs> you know, you know y'all, and y'all will be fresh, and you're like, damn, you know, why, can't I, why can't I do that? Right? And it's always this thing around, we have to build up our capacity, right? Because in our teaching, the other thing that we have to be able and willing to do is to unlearn. We have to unlearn all the madness that has dehumanized us. We have to unlearn those lies. So now, when you unlearn those lies, what are you putting back? What are you willing to play, replace that with? And when you replace that, now are you willing to take those lumps and bruises? Because this is the other thing about justice-centered teaching. It is never about if they are coming, right? And I don't need to explain who the they are, right? It is always about when they are coming. Right? And that's the opposition. In Chicago, we got a nickname for them. We call them the ops. Right? So this thing around when they come, right? Because now, depending on some schools that you're at, you know, we talk, we talk about the helicopter parent, right? The one that's always on all you, asking you about units and curriculum or what have you. No, they've intensified that. We got F1 bomber parents now. Right? They, they come in with paratroopers, right? <laughs> and they asking all these questions about it. And now, it's upon you to know what you're doing, right? And that thing is built up. And another thing at, in colleges, what we have to do is support you in that space, right? We cannot leave you hanging. Because a lot of times, when, you, when you're in teacher ed programs, it's kind of like, oh, great, you've graduated. Um, talk to you later, all right. <laughs> right, so now, how do we actually start to engage this, to think about this long term? Because the majority of teachers don't leave in years one through five. The majority of teachers leave in year one. And the thing that they always talk about is a sense of isolation. It's never the young folks. It's not even the administration. So now, how are we thinking about how we prevent isolation? And this is an important thing because I don't have to know <clears throat> a whole lot about Central Val or the San Joaquin Valley to understand that it's a pretty damn conservative place, right? And in those conservative places, any time that you put forward justice for those who have been historically excluded, there will always be a response. You must prepare yourself for that response. You must prepare yourself for when they come. And when they come, now who are you building alliances with? Because you will need those and those like you to stay alive in this. I know I'm coming to you all from Chicago and talking in a particular way. I do not do this work by myself. I team teach a class with one of my former undergraduate students. And this whole thing about, and I always love being in high schools because high schoolers do not care that you got a PhD. They like, look, homie, it's first period. <laughs> Shit, it's, it's 8 o'clock in the morning, bro. Look, you, you, you better figure some, man, look. I ain't got nothing for you, right? And, we, and, and when, I, when I teach first period, the first thing I always say is, it's first period. None of us want to be here. Let's figure it out. So what are we going to do, given the fact that none of us want to be here, right? So now, how do you talk about this in particular ways? How do you make sense of the lives of your students and not just in the rhetoric? 
because that's another thing. In teacher ed programs, we give y'all hella rhetoric. We got student-centered. We got culturally responsive. We got age-appropriate. We got STEM. Then folks flipped it to STEAM. Then you got some more cute I mean, we, we, got, we got every rhetorical purport to throw you off, right? So now the question becomes, what are you doing? The two simple questions of teaching is why and for what? Right? Why are you doing this? And for what purpose? Right? And that's a question that I'm asking all the time. Right? Literally saying, yeah, why? Right? And the other part, and see, we always, we always do this thing, we do you all dirty. We think about, y'all think about this nice, clean pathway to teaching. Teaching is life, right? So it's a whole lot of mess ups, right? I probably spent a week last semester apologizing to my high schoolers for messing up, right? I was like, man, y'all, I, I, I've got to do better. And high schoolers, they, they shot right back at me and said, okay, so what you gonna do to improve your condition? <laughs> and it was like, ain't that, ain't that what you tell us? And I'm like, shit, yeah. <laughs> Right? Well, how, how will you, and you know, then, then they started dropping the words on me. It's like, how will you change the paradigm? <laughs> right? How, how is this part of your humanizing experience? Right? And I was like, oh, damn. Right? And one of the things that I had to get with is really paying attention. Give you all a quick story. I used to be at a high school until YouTube, because YouTube now has a high school channel. But back in the day, YouTube was banned in the school that I work at. And I was trying to, and a lot of schools is probably still banned. So I, I needed to get on YouTube one day to find this clip. And I was like, man, y'all, we can't get on YouTube, blah, 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 blah. And one of my students just pulled my pants. He was like, Stovall, do you need to get on YouTube? <laughs> and I, I was like, yeah. He was like, look. And, he, and I was like, OK, what, what, you gotta, what do you have to do? He was like, look. Give me, give me a minute. He literally picks up his phone. He sticks his phone out the window because at every 20 minutes, him and the homies would hack the system so they could get on YouTube, <laughs> right? So he was like, look, I'm going to get this cold, doc. You got 15 minutes, <laughs> right? So whatever, whatever, whatever you're going to show, it cannot be longer than 15 minutes. <laughs> and I was like, man, word, it's seven. Perfect, right? And he was, he was like, because he was like, because, and, and he broke it down, he was like, because the codes change, right? Now, some people might think of that as defiant behavior. I needed to get on YouTube, <laughs> right? So whatever they had to do to get on YouTube, I'm with it, right? And now we have to think about that in terms of how do we make adjustments in the spaces, right? Slick word that y'all get now in Teacher Ed, how do we differentiate, right? So now, how do we start to think about this in different ways? And because we actually are doing this, and actually, I told that to a group of graduate students, and one of the graduate students was actually in the school that was next door, and she just started crying laughing. And she was like, oh, you know, she was like, damn, still, oh, you know that? She was like, they didn't pick that. It took them four years to pick that up, right? That young folks had figured out how to get on YouTube through their phones. Right? And this thing around, we often dismiss the genius of young folks and always think about it as deviance. So now this thing around, how do we make what we're trying to do make sense? And more importantly, how are we willing to fail at it? It's a different piece. One of the, one of the OGs put me on a book called The Queer Art of Failure. Right? And one of the things that they talk about is, if you're thinking about moving forward, one of the things that you have to first put forward is that everything isn't going to go right. The most important is, what do you do to pick up? Right? And I learned this from a master teacher who's not too far from you all in Arizona by the name of Curtis Acosta. And Curtis Acosta was a teacher in the Rasa Studies program in Tucson, Arizona. The Rasa Studies program had actually put forward a sense of willingness in young people to realize and actualize what it was they were trying to do in the world. 
And then the state government came and shut it down. They said that it was illegal for young people to claim their humanity. They lied on them and said that they were being taught how to hate America. And Curtis, always, Curtis's response was always, not only is that not true, but why is it always a crime when people of color teach themselves how to love each other? And this is the question that we have to ask. And Curtis and a group of folks were sued by the state. The decision came out last summer. And of 25 years of reading court cases and seeing legal decisions, I have never seen this decision. The judge said the state of Arizona acted with extreme animus, extreme racial hatred. But I do not know the remedy. It is the most puzzling decision I've seen, right? They recognize that the state of Arizona acted with hatred towards the Rock Raza Studies program, but they did not know a remedy. So now, if this is the world that we're living in, the question becomes, what are you willing to do to fight? Because there is a fight happening. And a lot of times, people get into teaching for the happy, shiny people reasons. Uh-uh. This thing is about you being able to fight, right? In fact, not just fighting, but being able to fight in a phone booth, right? It's that intimate, right? It's going to get up under you. And because it does, what are we willing to do to change that reality? Are we willing to refute deficit orientations around our young folk? Are we willing to interrupt that thing about always what young people can't do in opposed to what are the possibilities? Are you willing to look the powers that be in the face and say, here's what it is. I believe in my capacity of young folks to change the condition. They are not the future. They are right now because something is happening to them. And I'm going to work with them to change that reality. Right? So now our work becomes a little different. Some of y'all are like, damn, Stovall, I got up hella early in the morning. I ain't come here for this, right? <laughs> but here's the thing. If you were in classroom, if you were in a classroom with me, I would be reminding you this ad nauseum, right? Because I'm also in this fight, right? I just got, I just got kicked out of my own department, right? So this thing around how do we think about this work? Right? In ways for when they come for you, we can now collectivize with ourselves. Because again, you all are going to keep each other alive in this. In fact, some of that's probably happening right now. You know, you got the homies, you know, you started the teacher ant program, and then, you know, after that first couple of that first couple of months, you're looking at the homies, you're saying, what did I really do? <laughs> like this, I, I don't even know. Right? You kind of had, had that day where you staring out, like one of the homies is asking you, are you okay? And you're like, I think so. <laughs> right? You know, you, you, you all off, the class is right here, you all off in the trees, running, you know, you're like, I don't even know. Right? And then, and then, then you get up with some babies and now you, you getting down with the babies and then you're like, I, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I do not know. Right? And we actually make it for each other to know. Right? I actually work with a group of teachers in their first three years in a ethnic studies cohort, and it's about them actually doing the things collectively to remain in the profession. So they plan their work out together. They plan their, uh, they actually talk about situations in their schools or what have you. We got a text chain where we engage this. So last year, one of the folks in the collective, <clears throat> he told me the story and it was chilling to me. Now, I've been, working for young, I've been working with young folks and families for 25 years, right? So now, he tells me the story, and he just started teaching. He's now in his second year of teaching. He's about 25. And he said, my students came to me, and this was in January. His students told him that they had been at that school since kindergarten, and he was the teacher that has been with them 
the longest, and it was January. So those young folks had been from kindergarten to fifth grade, and they had not had a teacher stay the entire year. Right? Then at the end of the year, then he had, he had been having some problems with the administration and some of the leadership team and what have you. At the end of the year, about nine of his students came up to him and said, Mr. Williams, we need a, we need a meeting with you. And he was like, okay. They sat him down. Now these are 10 year olds. They sit him down and they say, Mr. Williams, we love what you've done with us. We really appreciate what you've done. We thank you so much for sticking with us. He said, but we see how they treat you. This is not a good place for you. You should leave. Do not worry about us. We are going to be okay. But because we love you, we want to see that you're okay. Do not stand for this. Do what you told us to do. We will be okay. Ten-year-olds, right? Ten-year-olds telling an adult, do not worry about us. We're going to be okay. We got what we need. But you can't be here. Because they told him they want him to stick in teaching. If I got that as a first-year teacher, Man, I'm in for the 20-year haul, <laughs> right? A group of young folks, because the thing that I was asking was, man, what did he instill in them? For them to see, to make that a type of adult decision, to say, look, we'll be okay, but we see how they treat you, right? And that's not, and that thing, and he was torn around whether or not to stay, right? And these types of things are the stories that now have, a, have folks like myself think entirely different about this, right? Because what will we actually do? Because teaching is not this thing around immediate results, right? You don't get that in teaching, right? You know, you have a little thing and then you're supposed to see it. Like, we now think about this as business and teaching as kind of product development. Mm -mm. That's not it. So now, this thing around, sometimes you don't really get what you did in a classroom until 10 years after you've done it. So if anybody isn't teaching for instant gratification, leave now, <laughs> right? So this thing around how do we now start to understand this in particular ways, and then what are we committed to when we talk about a deep understanding of our students, our content area, and the condition? Right? And when we have deep, deep knowledge about those three things, now we can make the various adjustments as we need them. And this is more difficult. This is more trying. And I think for you all, now it's upon engaging in that space. Right? We do a whole lot in the world to disparage teachers. But this thing around you all being able to claim your humanity and the humanity of the young people and families that you're working with is a revolutionary act, right? And I'll, and I'll say that on camera, right? And teaching is one of the most political things that you can ever do because all life is political, right? So this thing around not being, so there are no agnostic teachers, right? There are no neutral teachers, right? Paulo Freire says, if you have decided neutrality is your position, then you have sided with the oppressor. Right? And this thing around now, so if we think about that in real time, what is the justice condition for your babies? And what are you willing to do to enact that justice condition? Right? And now, who will you enact that justice condition with? Because you can't do it by yourself. And let me say this other thing. If anybody is coming into teaching because they just want to help, y'all can leave too. Because teaching has to be an art of solidarity. If you do not see yourself in your students, it will become very difficult for you to engage them. And now, this thing around how we think about what that solidarity means. 
right? Because we are talking about justice for those who have never received justice. We are talking about justice that is determined by the people who have not received justice. Now, in your position as a facilitator, how will you engage that? What will you do, right? And I'm not saying to this, this to you all as an expert, right? Because in PhDs, we get this false sense of reality with ourselves, right? And for anybody who has a PhD, this is what you got. Five people said you wrote a long ass paper about a little thing. <laughs> that's about it. So when you, when you engage your young folks, that's the first thing I tell my high schoolers, yeah, I wrote this long paper about a little thing. They say I got a PhD. Hey, that's up to question, right? Because I will definitely not claim myself to be an expert on something. I can say I studied something for a real long time. That's about it, right? The expertise comes in what, how are you living this, right? And when you're living this, are you living this in ways that sometimes will be unpopular? Again, a fight, right? Not in this hyper-masculine or toxic masculine, masculine way. A fight saying that you are engaged in something because you understand the justice condition and you are willing to engage that. Now, let me check in with you all. Is this stuff making sense? Yes. Uh, so this thing, I want to make sure that you all have time uh, to get to your workshops and then also engage, I know it's kind of a large room, but to engage in a little bit of dialogue in terms of questions uh, that folks might have because I know sometimes my verbal diarrhea is a little crazy, right? So this thing around, because I think those questions and the dialogues actually allow us to engage this. So if, if we can use the words, the dialogical dialecticism, right? And, and all that means is you're dialoguing about attention, right? Or a, a conflict, right? Because I know that many of us may vehemently disagree with, my, with what I've said, and that's okay. The thing is, my concern is, here in the San Joaquin Valley, there are real life issues. And if we do not pay attention to them, we will be engaged in the same dehumanization that we say we're trying to interrupt, right? So thank you all again. Huh? But if there, if there are questions that folks have or what have you, please don't feel inhibited uh, by the large room or what have you or there can be a staring contest. <laughs> uh -huh. Right, thank you for that. And is it all right if I repeat it to the group in case folks didn't hear it? So in one sentence defining the difference between school and education. School is this system in or of order, compliance, and control. Education is that system that asks questions of that order, compliance, and control to actually end the order, compliance, Class and control, right? So this thing around being, being painfully clear about that. Thank you for that because a lot of times we, you know, we will say stuff rhetorically and we won't connect it. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. I just want to say I'm probably the prime example of old white guy. <laughs> <laughs> Recognition is good. <laughs> I, I love what you said. I agree completely, and I'm so happy mm. that you. <laughs> thanks, for, thanks, for, appreciate it. Um, mm, mm. Are you on Twitter? <laughs> no, right? But but here's the way, and this is so my high schoolers and my college students, everybody gets on me about this. I'm I'm what the old folks refer to as a luddite, right? So the only thing I have is an email and a phone number, right? And they are. Uh, and that, that's just a way for me to make sure, and actually it's a way for me to make sure that I answer the emails, what have you, because you know, a lot of times stuff can get lost in the shuffle, so it's a whole thing. And one of my, my former college students who's a professor, she was cracking this joke with me. She was like, how are you blowing up on Twitter and you don't have a Twitter account? <laughs> I was like, I have no clue, right? So, and, and then me and, my, me and my wife have figured out like all these uh, strange hacking tools because she's an organizer and she doesn't have any social media so we can any open network we can get on but if it's closed I guess we are SOL right but that that thing but they oh and let me do this um 
So my email, best way to get in contact with me, again, my name is Dave Stovall, and uh, my email is, I'll explain it, but it's M like Mary, F like Frank, S like Steve, 8837 at Gmail. Now, some of you all looking like, what, what is this MFS, blah, blah, blah. If you couldn't tell, MFS is a curse word, <laughs> right? And the best way for me to remember my email is to curse and to remember my address. <laughs> so 8837 is the address of the house that I grew up in. So if I put those two together, it'll be very difficult for me to forget my email, right? So it's just a way for me to make sense of my own world, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Oh, how did, so, and I'll repeat this for the group. So how did I know I wanted to get into education? I was actually in this fifth grade classroom as a researcher, right? And it was a reading, they were, they were doing reading. And the teacher had actually saw me in another space. And she said, look, will you come to my classroom because I got some young folks who I think need to see you. So we started from there and then I started uh, teaching in a, in a teaching group or what have you. And then <clears throat> I was also doing community work. And some folks were saying, they're like, man, you know, you, you, can, you work pretty well with young folks. You should think about doing that. And so it was always that thing around making sure that I could engage with young folks and families. But now, what skills were we developing in those spaces? Right, so that was always the question. So that was my first foray into teaching, right? So I was in that fifth grade classroom. Then it was a history fair project in a couple of local schools. And then a good friend of mine pulled me into a program where she was teaching. She had a, a literature class that me and a couple other folks who were college professors got in, stayed in that. And then I was on the design team to build a high school. And we promised as members of the design team that we would teach classes there. So I've been teaching there since 05. Right, so that, that, and that's, a, that's my law. So teaching really, I came to teaching really through the back door, right? In terms of not having, uh, not getting into formal teacher education programs until much later. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Can you describe the teacher that had the greatest influence on you? Yep. Describing the teacher that had the greatest influence on me. It was actually, I think about them as a, because it's a collective of them, right? The first one was Miss Lester, who was my fourth grade teacher. Miss Lester was the one who said, look, you have to figure something out, right? The world wants to do something. You have to interrupt that, right? So that always stuck, that always stuck in my head. Then I had a, uh, sorry, Miss Lester was my fifth grade teacher. Uh, Mr. Dennis was my fourth grade teacher, who also ended up becoming my high school football coach. And then um, Mr. Hammond was uh, my sixth grade teacher. And then in high school, I had two teachers. One was named Mr. Searson, and the other one was named Mr. Winters. And Mr. Winters was just like this, I, I don't, I, to this day, I can't really like explain Mr. Winters, right? Because he was this dude who was just like, we always thought he was high. That's, that was the first thing, right? <laughs> right, but he would, he, would, he would always, and he would always, he would, uh, when he would talk, his, his hair would always go back. Like, hey, man. <laughs> and all those, and we'd be like, what is this dude on, right? But the thing about Mr. Winters was, whatever you wanted, to do, he would always ask this question. How does that make sense to you? Right? So I just want you to explain how that makes sense to you as someone who doesn't know. Right? So he, he reframed this whole thing around writing for an audience. Right? So this thing, so it was that always stuck with me in terms of my K-12 teacher. So those six folks were the folks who really had some influence uh, in terms of how I approached things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, how do you how do I describe this? How do you implement like class behavior management mm -hmm. with without feeding 
anything like the whole oppressive school environment? First thing, stop calling it behavior management. Okay. <laughs> right? Because it's, it, because it's, it's this thing, it's the carcerality in it, right? I mean, it's, just always, it's always this thing around folks are, like young folks are to be controlled, right? Now, there's this difference between control and structure, yes. right? Because young folks appreciate structure. Young folks want people to know what they're doing. Right, we always make that assumption around young folks, right? So this thing around really, and it's a deeper question, because we now have to ask questions about how are we building relationships with young folks, right? And when I say that, people are always thinking about, are you becoming Facebook friends? No, right? You, you, not, you should not be on Snapchat with your students. It's off top, right? But this thing around now, what are we willing to put forward in terms of developing that relationship? Because a lot of times, we do this in an intrusionary way, right? We always ask young folks to tell us about them. We never tell them about us, right? So this thing around, so now, here's, here's where I'm from and all this, listen, stuff might be different. Let's start there, right? And getting away from getting folks in trouble and into that carceral system really around saying, all right, if there's something that's happening, I need to let, you need to let me know, but also, if you want to talk to someone, first establishing that they're not in trouble because you want to talk to them, right? So this thing, this really becomes important. And then, you know, first day of classes, it's an, it's an important thing, and people always think about this, and when I did this, I was like, oh, it changes the nature of things, right? In opposed to calling families when people are in trouble, what does it mean to call families to introduce yourself? I say, hey, look, I'm Dave, you know, I got you more, and I learned this from an a, a OG preschool teacher. He said the first thing that he would always tell families is, you know more than I will ever know about your son and daughter, and I need your help. Changes the whole relationship. Right? But you do that on the first day, not in the crisis moment. Right? Because classroom management is always about the crisis moment. Right? They're all, they're all, I don't get, mm -mm. Have we, have we really looked, have we gone deep around what that space is? Because now we go right back to that assumptive space. Right? And now when we go back to that assumptive space, we're taking away from really establishing those relationships. Now, you know, are there challenges? Of course. But I think getting us out of this box of thinking about classrooms as these didactic spaces where control is implemented in opposed to relationships are built. Right? That's a, that's a, that's a different space. No? Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Felt like I missed some. Yes, sir. Right. Yes. And, and I think this is, I mean, thank you for that. So the question was, how, do I, how did I prepare myself for when they come? I think my years as a youth worker allowed me to think about what are the tactics that people use, right? And I think in a quote unquote nice field like education, we all should study passive aggressive behavior, <laughs> right? I mean, I think that's a really important thing, right? Because that's, I think, the first line of defense that passive aggressive behavior will, so they'll, they'll ask you these benign questions about your content, right? Oh, so, and, and they'll do it slick, right? Oh, that's interesting. Interesting. White supremacist word for what are you doing, <laughs> right? So this thing around, and they, and they say, oh, well, that's, that's interesting. And then they'll ask you questions around the pedagogy. How will you communicate that, right? Or I'm deeply concerned about what this will do with our young folks, right? And really key yourself up for that language, right? What is the language of the opposition? And when they start to use that language, now you're clear about what it is that you're doing. So that's really that why, right? Or that content message because they won't come at you. The students, they come for a second. They come for you first with the content. So now, when you see that that content is, and always keep it local. So when you talk about the content, you say, well, I want my young folks to
to ask questions of their condition. I want them to be asked to be able to ask an inquiry about this particular thing. Now, here's where you never have to worry. I guarantee it will map on to the California State Board of Education standards. <laughs> I guarantee it, right? Because the standards are written in this benign way, right? So for example, like, you know, now we get, everybody gets hit with the common core, what have you, right? The common core says stuff like, students should be able to write an expository essay based on research. <laughs> they ain't say about what, <laughs> right? So this thing around being able to now, because, and, and I think it's a different way to plan, right? So you don't, and I learned this from a science teacher. He always would say, the last thing you look at is the standards. The first thing that you're trying to do is what skills are you trying to communicate, right? So now in the development of those skills, you don't have to worry about them mapping on to the standards. They'll map on, right? That's the least of the worries. Just spend time in planning that thing out that you're trying to do, right? Because now, when they come for you, the first thing you say is, well, this is standard 6.9.8.3.2.6, right? So I, I'm, the content is reflective of the standard, right? So this thing around really kind of preemptive now to your question, that's a different type of planning, right? That's not these, that, those are much more iterative units than these kind of hard and fast units. So these are kind of the units that you can make adjustments in in opposed to having a very static, right? But again, that planning, and that is probably best done with a collective of people. Last thing, it is important, I will say this for everybody, to find the folks in those buildings who know what they're doing, right? And you gotta have a conversation with them. Right? You got to have a conversation with them on how that place operates. You got to have a conversation about them, about the haters. You got to gotta have this conversation about them. And then from those folks, then you ask them, who in this place do you feel knows what they're doing? And then you got to go talk to them. Right? So good teaching is always extra work. Right? I mean, that's, 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 just, that's just the reality of the situation. Right? Because if we're dealing with all these things, in order to interrupt that, we have to surpass that thing that is dehumanizing us. Right? So it's always that extra work. All right? And I think that's in, those things are important for when they come. All right? Because it's not if. Right? Yes, ma'am. So you and that young person now is working. Let me repeat that for the group. So a uh, young person is responding to her in a very different way, but admin is always putting these roadblocks and barriers, making it very difficult for them to actually do the things that they want to do in those classroom spaces. I think two things in this. The first one is you and that young person should always have a check-in with each other around the navigation of the place, right? I think that's really important because now, if they understand you as refuge in that place, now it's around developing the strategy so they can get through those other places. The second thing with that is now you two now figure out who else are allies in that space, right? So now when you, when you find out who are allies in that space, now you can have, so now you've broadened the group of people <coughs> that they can connect with. Now, the third thing, and this is the thing that becomes important. When you all identify the allies, you and the allies have to meet with admin, right? So now we're thinking about this as an organizer, right? So you're building power, right? So this thing around, so now when you meet with the organizer, I mean the, the admin, the first thing is, you're saying is, well, we've actually devised a strategy that works well with this student. We want him to be there, and he, he or she is brilliant, right? And this thing around that kind of hold, because the thing for any administrators in this, an administrator never expects you to do that, right? An administrator just expects you to kind of capitulate, kind of try to figure it out, and just kind of fall back. But when you come in with the assets of that student and say, look, let's show, and show them some work, 
Show the administrator some work. I said, look, he's capable, and he's capable of doing these things, but we can't keep crashing on him, right? So this thing around, so now when they're able to see that, there's the greater potential that it might take off pressure. Now, let's go to the other part. In case it doesn't, right, the people that you all have navigated, uh, that, you all, that you all have navigated as, as allies, now you all engage in a more fugitive space where you're still checking in with each other and making sure that he or she can get through the things that they need to get through. Because that, that's another part of this, right? Because we're talking about navigating spaces that are hostile and violent. And we're not talking about the behavior of young people. We're talking about the carcerality of the school, right? And the expectations that's placed on that young person. So I think those things become critically important in terms of being able to navigate that. Because sometimes, you know, we do that one route, we might have to go another. But always being able to figure that out. Yep. All right. No, because of this, if, if, because the thing is, in these spaces, when folks are isolated in that way, now we have to build, we have to build folks' capacity to now engage that. So that check-in with him becomes critically important, right? And, those, and identifying those allies, again, becomes important because they're hitting him in all these different ways, right? So now it's about building out places that they can connect to. Because if he doesn't, then they go right back to the nexus, right? They go right, they go right back to this carceral thing, right? He should be in jail, right? This type of thing is saying, well, no, let's actually think about this. And then when you take that approach to, and this is for everybody who is engaged in these type of situations, when you take that approach, it is critically important, everybody, that you document what you're doing, right? Because one of the ways that the ops will work will say that that never happened, right? You want to document that this stuff has happened when you did it, give copies to all the necessary folks because you want to you show what folks have been able to do because they always tell us about this with units and lesson plans, but it's never when it, when it gets real, that's, those are the things that we need to be documenting. Um, they, I know, again, I want to be respectful of y'all's time, but I'll still be here, because I know folks have workshops or what have you, and they, they got a couple of housekeeping things that they want to do, but I'm around, I'll be up here, and folks will, will be able to prepare for the workshops. Thank you all again. Hopefully this is making sense. Mm -hmm.